Happy training camp eve to those who celebrate. I'm Chris Hassel. All veterans scheduled to report by this time tomorrow. Minus a couple of teams who have already reported. The Raiders and the Jaguars. Both of those teams already starting camp with their matchup in the Hall of Fame game a week from Thursday. We took you to Raiders camp last week. We are with the Jags today and tomorrow. Year two for Trevor Lawrence, but it feels like a new beginning with Doug Peterson taking over following the failed Urban Meyer experiment. And right now, they're as healthy as they can be, just about. James Robinson and some other players able to participate in drills this week. Let's take you out to Jacksonville. Pete Prisco and Rick Spielman standing by. Uh, Pete, you were there last year for camp, and you were pretty outspoken about the, I guess, odd experience you had there at Urban Meyer's camp. How does this year compare? Well, one looks like a professional football team, and the other one did not. I mean, that's the biggest difference. Doug Peterson's a pro. He's been around. He has skins on the wall. He won a Super Bowl, and he understands what the players need, what they want. He doesn't treat them like children, and I think that's the biggest difference. And throughout the offseason, a lot of Jaguar players have talked about that. They, they like to be treated like men. They like to be respected by their coach, and they felt last year that wasn't the case. So it's an entirely different camp, and oh, by the way, there's no horn in the back telling us to hydrate and hustle. <laughs> I know you love the bullhorn guy. Hey, Rick, what were your takeaways from your day there with the Jaguars? Yeah, just looking at the practice and watching the energy, watching the enthusiasm, it was like, Pete, like you were taught, they love football again. And, you know, you have to be um, – very demanding but yet fair to these players and I think that you can see how much that these players respect Doug Peterson and his staff and what they're trying to accomplish down here demanding you gotta, but fair. You, know, you gotta look to your coach so going into the going into training camp we don't have any PUP guys um, James is doing extremely well um, you know uh, he, he's gonna be out here and over here uh, we're just gonna you know, still take it slow with him and make sure he's 100% or better uh, before we put him out uh, on the field. Um, Darius Williams is another one uh, who's doing extremely well. Uh, you'll see him out here doing some individual work and, and running around. Uh, I, was, I will just say this, that we've got two guys that kind of out of the conditioning test yesterday that uh, we're going to maybe – Jamal Agnew is, an, is one that we're just still going to kind of day by day with him. Uh, he'll, he'll be out here and, and working with some, some individual work and – working with our medical team, but just kind of day-to-day -day with him. And uh, Devin Lloyd uh, is the one that um, uh, is probably going to miss a little bit of time. He's got a little hamstring that, that popped up yesterday on him. And um, nothing too significant, but, but we're just going to be cautious with him and, and, uh, and give him some time. As for James Robinson, he's coming back from a torn Achilles alongside fellow running back Travis Etienne, who wasn't able to play at all his rookie season with a Liz Frank injury. ETN back and working double duty today as a member of the press as well during Trevor Lawrence's availability. How does it feel to have ETN in the backfield? <laughs> John, 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 his his gloves with your uh, towel again. Oh, I didn't miss that. I'm gonna have to wear an extra towel because he's always taking my towel. But no, it's great to have my guy back. Uh, been together for a while. Missed him last year. Just excited to have him back. He's gonna add a a uh, very explosive element to our, our offense. Uh, it's going to help us a lot and just get, getting back to some winning around here. So we're excited. Now Lawrence happy to have his college mate alongside him once again. And he could certainly use a security blanket after throwing more picks than touchdowns last season, which ended with the league worst 14 losses. Lawrence on everything he and his team have to prove this season. You know, personally, I want to um, you prove that I belong here and that I'm the player that I believe I am um, and this organi organization believes I am. And then as a team, I think we have a lot to prove. Just didn't have a great year last year. Um, and I know the guys in this locker room um, are ready to, to prove some stuff this year. So having that motivation and then just, just having this new opportunity, get a clean slate, everybody starts at the bottom and having a chance to work your way up. You know, that's a special opportunity that we got this year. And we got a good enough group to win as many games as we want to. We just got to make that decision and, and be prepared, and uh, we'll have a good year. The over-under win total is six and a half. Here are the fantasy projections for Trevor Lawrence. Over 4,000 passing yards and 22 passing touchdowns. Now, that, that's right about what the odds say right now in season-long player props. His passing yard total is about 3,900. 
and his passing touchdown total is set at 22 and a half. Yes, we did. Yep, yep, yep. Me. It was me. Uh, yes. Let's take you out to Jacksonville. Pete Prisco and Rick Spielman standing by. Uh, Pete, you were there last year for camp, and you were pretty outspoken about the, I guess, odd experience you had there at Urban Meyer's camp. How does this year compare? Well, one looks like a professional football team and the other one did not. I mean, that's the biggest difference. Doug Peterson's a pro. He's been around. He has skins on the wall. He won a Super Bowl. And he understands what the players need, what they want. He doesn't treat them like children. And I think that's the biggest difference. And throughout the offseason, a lot of Jaguar players have talked about that. They, they like to be treated like men. They like to be respected by their coach. And they felt last year that wasn't the case. So it's an entirely different camp. And, oh, by the way, there's no horn in the back telling us to hydrate and hustle. <laughs> I know you love the bullhorn guy. Hey, Rick, what were your takeaways from your day there with the Jaguars? Yeah, just looking at the practice and watching the energy, watching the enthusiasm. It was like, Pete, like you were taught, they love football again. And, you know, you have to be um, – very demanding but yet fair to these players and I think that you can see how much that these players respect Doug Peterson and his staff and what they're trying to accomplish down here demanding Young team. but you gotta, fair you, know, you gotta look to your coach yeah and Doug Peterson is the the new head coach and maybe the expectation should not have been as high for Trevor Lawrence coming out as you know the next Andrew Luck basically is what we we called him many of us were thinking he was going to win offensive rookie of the year and the Jaguars could maybe challenge for a playoff berth that didn't happen in year one. Pete, what are his expectations in year two? Much higher. Uh, and look, you can look at his last year and look at all the stats and the data and the way he plays and watch the tape. It was unfair to him. The offense wasn't good. Uh, the talent around him was not good. The system wasn't good. He wasn't coached very well. But other than that, go out and play quarterback. And I think <laughs> what you have to do with Trevor Lawrence is go back to the last game of the season against the Colts. The Colts were playing for a playoff spot. They win, they're in. And Trevor Lawrence looked like the guy we expected him to look like. He was smart. He was accurate. Uh, he made a throw into the back of the end zone that tells you what kind of player he can be. I think he's going to take a big leap forward. I've said it all along. I'm looking along the lines of 4,200 yards and maybe 32 touchdown passes, and the weapons are better around him, Rick. Yeah, if you look at what Trent Baalke was able to do this offseason and adding a Kirk and adding a Jones along with uh, Marvin Jones on the roster, and then the tight ends to get Ingram, and then if you get both these running backs, Bat at Tanay and uh, and Robinson, they're going to have a lot of weapons, and it's not going to put as much pressure on a young quarterback to be the guy. He's going to have guys around him that are going to be able to help out. He can distribute the ball, and he can uh, he's going to help uh, help them make plays. And health was a topic today. And uh, usually, when we're talking the health of a team, we're talking about guys who are injured. Not really the case for Jacksonville, at least not yet. I know it's really early, but but how about Pete? The relative health of this team with the two running backs healthy again, Etienne and Robinson. Well, Robinson's still kind of working on the side. They're kind of working him back in. But the fact that he's not on the pup list is incredible. The guy tore his Achilles tendon in December. I mean, it's amazing. And we've seen this happen with running backs. I mean, Cam Akers came back and played in the same season last year. Now, was he the same back? No. But it is amazing that James Robinson is on the practice field. Uh, he's not on the pup list. And they want him to be a guy who can carry the football. And they can use ETN in a lot of different ways. They can get ETN out in the passing game. Uh, they can line him up as a wide receiver, which is something he wants to do. He told me that. Uh, so it'll be real interesting if they can get Robinson back for the regular season open. Yeah, by not putting him on PUP tells you that they're very confident they'll have him back for the season opener because most times the only time a team can put a player on PUP and actually then put him on reserve PUP at the cutdown is if they did it today. So every indication that we saw him moving around today, uh, them not putting him on the PUP list, that they expect him to be ready for the opener. And it's a good one-two combination, Chris. you got a power runner and you got a speed guy. It's a nice one-two combination if they both get if, – if Robinson can get back to being healthy. With a hamstring, not on the pup list, but dealing with an injury. What's the latest on him? 
Yeah, and that's you don't want to see that opening uh, your training camp experience for the NFL with a hamstring injury. And from what I was told, he heard it uh, the last couple of days. Uh, and they're just being cautious with him. Uh, I think this is one of those situations where if it was a regular season week, he would probably practice and play. They're just being a little more cautious. He's a big part of what they want to do. Remember, Miles Jack is not here. Uh, they let him go, and they replaced him with not only Devin Lloyd, but Chad Muma, another linebacker they drafted out of Wyoming. And, and they also have Foya Olakun who's going to be a really good player next to him. So their linebacker group is upgraded. It's going to be faster, but you got to get Lloyd on the field. Yeah, and I'm excited to see him because when you watched his tape in college, uh, he's a big athletic linebacker that can play the run. But the thing that really stuck out to me, and I'm interested on how they're going to implement this, is how good he is as a blitzer. And when you can get a linebacker that size and match him up when they're pass protecting up front and he has to get one-on-one with a running back, that's going to be a mismatch all day. And I think by blitzing him and having him also be a part of the package, they're going to be able to pressure the quarterback along with Walker, along with Allen and a lot of the guys that we saw today. They're going to be pretty solid on defense. Yeah, they were last in the NFL in a bunch of defensive categories last season, including takeaways and three and out percentage. They hope that the defense can take some of the pressure off that offense And Doug Peterson, I mean, he was kind of Brandon Staley before Brandon Staley. When he was with the Eagles, nobody went for it on fourth down more. But how do you balance that aggression that Peterson likes with a young quarterback who was coerced into a lot of interceptions last season? Let me defer to my analytics buddy over here. <laughs> me and Pete were talking about analytics, and I couldn't believe what a math was he is and how, how much he believes in analytics. So what I, I think you're going to have to do is Doug's got to learn this team first. That's the number one thing. But analytics is a tool that you use to try to help make decisions. But what analytics cannot do is when that coach has 60-some thousand people screaming at him and it's fourth and one and they're playing against the number one defense versus the run in the NFL, are you still going to go for it? So analytics creates conversation. It just takes numbers. But these coaches are the ones that are responsible on whether to go for it or not. And the numbers don't you don't see the numbers on the weather conditions, uh, um, injuries, I'm, anything like that. I'm old school. You know that. I'm an old school guy. I, I believe in analytics. I think they're a supplement to what you do. But game flow matters. Where you do it matters. This isn't Madden football. And everybody, I know the <laughs> analytics guys, they love it. Oh, just go for it. Go for it all the time. It's Madden football. I learned this when I was 12 years old playing Madden football. <laughs> That's all well and good. But Brendan Staley cost himself some games left. Last year, And I think you have to be better with how you use your analytics. Game flow matters. If the game is 6-3 and you have a fourth and one, you don't go for it. If it's 45-41 and you have a fourth and one, you go for it. There's different situations that matter. It's not just about the numbers. Right, and I can tell you about algorithms, but when you're trying to teach me about how to do long division again, which I haven't done since the third grade, I think that's where your analytics actually stopped. (laughs) All right, Pete, uh, you spoke with Christian Kirk, the prize free agency uh, acquisition rather of the Jaguars earlier today. Got a kick out of that conversation because you you rose the question to him. What about those people who who think that this wide receiver room has has a lot to prove? And he looked at you and and he said, yeah, if you have that, if you have that thought, you should keep that to yourselves because that's not the way we are thinking of it. What did you take away from your combo with Kirk? Yeah, and it was an interesting conversation because I also asked him about being having a bullseye, being the high, you know, one of the highest paid wide receivers in the league. When a lot of people think he should be should have been paid that money, I think he should have been. I think this is a rising player. You pay rising players. You don't pay for what you've done. You pay for what you're going to do. And sometimes in free agency, it becomes names over games. And I think this is a game that's going to take itself to the next level in this offense. Uh, look, I threw out 80 80 catches. He he said that's low. Uh, basically, and he's going to get above that. I said 12 touchdowns. He said he'd take it. So I think this is a big year for Christian Kirk. Yeah, and he's a very good player. I'm not going to argue with that, but I think he's best in the slot where he can create mismatches and utilize his quickness. I don't think he's a speed guy, and the only concern I have with him is how many big explosive-type plays down the field will he be able to make. Now, he's going to make a ton of plays, I think, in this West Coast system, in this outside zone system, and getting the ball in his hands. But I don't see him like a Tyreek Hill, who once they get the ball in their hands, they can just go and make a 10-yard reception into an 80-yard touchdown. There's a lot of Tyreek Hills in this league, aren't there? <laughs> like one. <laughs> Apparently, when Pete was talking about his high school days, it was him and Steve Hutchinson. But I thought, were you a... I was a guard. He was a okay. tackle. He's the second best. That, okay. That's a whole other story. Hey, Pete, uh, the boss just walked in. Port, what color is, is Pete's shirt? What would you say that is? 
Fuchsia? Teal. Fuchsia. He's going Fuchsia. with teal. The there it is, Pete. Up. He tried to claim earlier it's, it's not green. teal, he it's green. Teal because he's it's in green. Jacksonville. It's green. Hey, guys, let's look ahead to I'm week one. I'm the mayor one. of the city. I don't I need to wear are. the shirt I team colors, are. Chris. Hey, hey, Rick told us that he likes the Jags to win outright in week one in D.C. They're four-point dogs. He's got them plus 170 on the money line. What do you see from that first chunk of games that also includes the Colts and trips to the Chargers and the Eagles? Well, I think it's a tough start for them. I mean, look, you you have them one and zero out of the gate already, and people around the league are already buzzing about that. They're talking about <laughs> it, as you know. Um, I, look, they can win that game, but that's a tough way to start. You, you know, the Colts are division team. They they've traditionally played well against them, but you get you, you know the Eagles. I think are going to be a good team, and we know the Chargers are. So it's a tough way and, to start. And those are two tough road uh, yeah. games to go out to L.A. to play in SoFi Stadium, and then to go to. Uh, Philadelphia, the uh, reunion of so supposedly Doug Peterson coming back there and seeing what kind of team he can put against his old team. But those are going to be tough games. But I think if they can get that first win, which I'm predicting they will, and then they got Houston kind of in that fifth slot, and if they can, you know, on their home opener somehow surprise Indy, they may be three and two for the first five games. Is it tough for a young team to go on the road right away? Is that tough to handle? I think they have enough veteran leadership on this roster. They do have a young team, but enough guys that they brought in this offseason with all the free agents that they signed that have been in situations like that and will help bring along the young kids. We took our rookie on the road, and he's done great so far, <laughs> let me tell you. Already carrying you, Pete, and looking forward to more coverage coming up later on today and tomorrow when you'll be talking with uh, Trevor Lawrence. Guys, thank you so much. Great job out there in Jacksonville covering the Jags, who are plus 750 to win the AFC South. They're 4-1. to one to make the postseason with an over-under win total of six and a hook. Do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game, the highlights, the picks, the instant analysis, no yelling, no fake debates, no politics? Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.